Welcome to the Rob Burgess Show. I am, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 46th episode, our guest is Stephen Hyden. Stephen Hyden has written for Grantland, The AV Club, Rolling Stone, Pitchfork, Slate, and Salon. He lives in Minnesota. His first book, Your Favorite Band is Killing Me, What Pop Music Rivalries Reveal About the Meaning of Life, was published in 2016. And now, on to the show. So I, I really enjoyed your 10-part series, the uh, What Have or Happened Alternative Nation, and I was just saying that I, uh, I, I, when I read your book, I definitely noticed a lot of, it seems like the germ of some of the ideas that ended up in this book kind of sprung from that uh, place, uh, and I was just going to ask you about the origins of that original series and if you thought there was a, a connection there. Yeah, um, man, it's been a while since I wrote that. That was like 2010 into 11, so I'm trying to remember exactly where the idea came from. I I think I just, I wanted to write like a big thing, like a big essay. I think that's where it started, just wanted to write something kind of epic. And um, in a way, it was a dry run for writing a book, you know, because that series, I think it was like 50,000 words, and it had an arc to it, Mm -hmm. and... It, 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 it felt like writing a book. I mean, that's, like when I actually did write a book, I felt like doing that alternative nation series was almost like a dry run for that. So, like mm-hmm. when you talk about there being parallels between that and the book, you know, I don't know if I was conscious of that, mm-hmm. but I can definitely see why that would be the case. I, um, yeah, I mean, but, the '90s have been particularly on everyone's mind lately, just with the the OJ things coming out, and I feel like the you know Nirvana is getting a, a second go again, and it's like we're all kind of like I feel like the '90s are very very back. So I felt like that uh, I was going back and reading that a little bit lately, and it's like yeah, this, this still resonates. A lot of the themes are still the same uh, from the '90s. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when I wrote that, I. Yeah, and maybe this was just true for me, but I felt like at the time, a lot of the 90s bands, like a lot of the big 90s bands, um, it wasn't that they were forgotten, but people weren't talking about them as much. Mm-hmm. In some cases, I, I feel like they were maybe passe, you know, or out of fashion. Um, and, like, you know, I mean, Nirvana has always kind of been heralded as a, as a as an important band, but you know, like Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, even Pearl Jam to a degree, you know, people weren't talking about them as much like in two thousand ten. Mm-hmm. And like for me, what intrigued me about that series was that it was a way kind of for me to rediscover some of that music. Uh mm-hmm. because at that time it had been a while since I had listened to a lot of that stuff and I didn't feel as much of a connection to it when I when I wrote that series and like the process of doing that kind of reconnected me to a lot of that Mm -hmm. and what was really cool about it was that in a way it was kind of like reclaiming a part of my own past you know because I don't like when I wrote that I was in my um early 30s Mm -hmm. and I think I had gone through a period like where I was sort of you know, not really into, like, what I liked as a teenager, you know, mm-hmm. uh, or I was almost maybe embarrassed by what I liked as a teenager, mm-hmm. and, you know, the process of writing that series and kind of reconnecting with those bands, it was kind of like reclaiming a part of my own past, you know, mm-hmm. you know and, and, like, listening to those records, it was kind of like remembering, like, what I heard in those albums originally, and, like, what I was like at that time. So it was really, it was like a process of discovering those bands, but it was also kind of like a process of self-discovery, in a way, Mm -hmm. uh, that made it, I think, like, the people that like that series, I think, they like the discussion of the bands, but I think there's also something else about, Mm -hmm. you know, what maybe that era signified for certain people, you know? Um, I, I wrote about my personal experience with that, and I think, Maybe people related to, like, what I went through. Like, I don't think I was unique. I think my experience maybe was universal in some respect, you know, at least other in a way that other people could relate to. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I like that idea of kind of reclaiming your own past because, I mean, there's always those, like, Facebook things where people are putting, like, what was the ten albums you were listening to in junior high? And I'm like, 
E, I don't know if I want to share that right now. I could, I could tell you that my second album I ever bought was Weezer's Blue album, but I would be lying if the first album, if I didn't tell you the first album I ever bought was New Kids on the Block. So, um, yeah, you know, yeah, I, it's all in there, you know. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's always funny looking at those lists because you can tell the people who are being honest and you can tell the people like sort of trying to retrospective, like retroactively improve their case. <laughs> But yeah, I, respect, I, was, I respect my friend uh, David, who example for example put three Creed records, and he's not a person today I would think right. of as somebody that likes Creed. You know what I mean? So I I respect that he put he put that out there. You know what I'm saying? So. Well, like when that was like a like a meme, you know, and people were talking yeah. about that. Like joke on that was that my top ten would just be uh, like the Adam Sandler album. Uh, they're all gonna laugh at you, <laughs> you know, because like that's actually what I was listening to a lot when I was in eighth grade. You know, uh-huh. you know like. And then you see lists, and people are like, "Yeah, I was listening to Sonic Youth and Black Flag and Minor Three, you know, like all these like cool bands." And like, I was listening to like White Light, White Heat by the Velvet Underground when I was. And it's like, okay, no, no, yeah, you were, you were, you just had the best taste when you were a teenager, you know. Mm-hmm. You, I mean, I think, um, you know, like when I wrote that Alternative Nation series, like one of the. Um, one of the uh, installments is on the band Live, mm. you know, who I loved when I was 17, you know, like they had that album Throwing Copper. Sure. It came out in 55, like I loved that album. Mm-hmm. I don't think I've listened to that album. I mean, I, I listened to that album when I wrote that series, but I haven't really listened to it since. And it's easy to make fun of that band now. It's a pretty corny band. And, you know, Ed Kowalczyk, the lead singer, he's like this bald guy with his shirt on. Who, <laughs> Lightning crashes, you know, the placenta falls to the, to the floor, all that stuff, you know. I mean, they're a terrible band, but, like, it was kind of fun, like, when I was writing that series, to listen to that album and remember a time in my life when that was a huge part of my life, when I loved that record. And it wasn't about sort of arguing now that that album is great. It was about trying to understand, like, what did I see in that album at a certain time in my life? What did millions of other people see because that album sold like seven million copies right like it was a huge record so i just think that's a fascinating thing like trying to you know you know because people always have this thing about sort of revisionism or like you're just defending shitty albums and you know that whole thing Mm -hmm. Uh, for me it wasn't about that it was about just trying to understand like what you see in it and you could still kind of laugh at it but Mm -hmm. i don't know I, I, i think that's an interesting uh process uh you know to go through um that's one of the ugliest album covers too by the way <laughs> it really is i had it uh, also on cd it was it was pretty weird <laughs> and like what's so weird too is that like i like that album so much that i actually bought a t-shirt because i saw <laughs> live play live mm. saw a concert and i bought a throwing copper t-shirt that had that album cover on it and i think like the color of the shirt <laughs> was the same kind of color of the album cover, so it was like this sort of muddy green right. brown. And then had the album and this was a garish album cover. It's like why did I buy this shirt? Right. It's the ugliest shirt yeah. ever. Uh, I mean I kinda wish I still had it. It'd be amazing to see this shirt now, but mm-hmm. I just remember it being so ugly. Uh, but I bought it because I liked Live in 1995. Right, but I mean, you know, th- without that, you wouldn't be the person you are today. And, and you know, you have to take the good with the bad. Is even when you look back and try to think, maybe was I listening to the coolest music? Probably not, because I think certain for certain people, I don't know where you. Uh, if you gr- did, you grow up in a high school that was big or small. Um, my class had like 400 people, so okay. I guess that's on the, uh, is that big? I guess that, so. I, I had a, I had a hundred, but I know that's small, okay. so I don't know. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm just saying I grew up in a very small town and I went to a very small high school. So even if there was things I wasn't necessarily into just through osmosis, uh, you're going to get some Limp Biscuit. Some people are going to be listening to some ICP. It's just going to be out there. It's just going to be happening. So, I mean, me, a person that loves music, is not going to not hear that, you know what I mean, even if I wouldn't seek it out, you know what I mean? And that was a part of my growing up, you know. So maybe you can yeah, avoid I mean, I'm just saying maybe you can avoid that more in a larger high school. I don't know. but <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, like when I wrote that series, I, I feel like um, – I mean, it's so weird to talk about this. I mean – 
like it's a distant past. I mean, but it, it, it was kind of a long time ago that I wrote that. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was that was still like what kind of indie rock was zeitgeisty, you know, like, like mm-hmm. they were band like Animal Collective and Grizzly Bear mm-hmm. and all those bands like were, were pretty big at the time. So it was sort of an idea of like what indie rock was and like alternative rock from the 90s, it really wasn't part of that lineage. You know, like people kind of like, like the sort of pitchfork idea of what indie rock is, like, you know, it's kind of disdainful of what 90s all rock was, you know, which, uh, you know, and, and, and a reason why, a reason why for that disdain is that alt rock totally devolved into this like, ugly sounding post grunge kind of mush by the end of the decade where you had like stained and mm-hmm. uh you know and then Creed and Nickelbacks and all that stuff. But you know, that's what that music turned into. Mm-hmm. Um so like when I wrote that series, it did seem kind of fresh to remind people that you know, like when grunge was new it really did seem revolutionary. Like, but for me, like as a 13, 14 year old kid getting into those bands, like it really did feel like, wow, this is like important. This is like, I really did think that it was changing the world, you know, like, mm-hmm. and <laughs> I, it seems kind of silly to say that out loud. Like I'm slightly embarrassed even now to say that, mm-hmm. but like, that's how I felt at the time. And there were a lot of people that felt that way. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, you can look at it and say like, well, Grunge was a marketing scheme, you know, created by record labels to sell mainstream rock bands to 14-year-old kids like me, you know, which is true. But there is something to be said for the belief, you know, even if it is marketing. If people actually believe that something is changing the world, in some respect it is, you know, and that belief has power. And um, I don't know, I think that there's value sometimes in, like, not looking at things with the benefit of hindsight, but of trying to kind of recover the sort of naivete that you had at the time, like when you first heard something, you know, and you didn't have sort of the benefit of of cynicism, you know, mm-hmm. or like this sort of all-knowing, you know, sort of veneer, you know, of of, of, of cool and remove and all that stuff. Right, right. Uh, and I don't know, like for me... Like in music writing, that's always been kind of a goal of mine in writing about music because I feel like in rock criticism there's always been this sort of, um, I don't know, critics often take this sort of like, I don't want, I mean, I don't want to say ivory tower, that's sort of a cliche, but like this, this sort of thing like where I can't be bothered with emotions, you know, Mm -hmm. or I can't be bothered with sort of, hyperbole or passion or this thing where I'm actually going to believe in something like where you, you know, where you hold yourself at a remove from actually being affected by something. Mm-hmm. Like there's been a lot, there's a lot of music writing like that. And I've always kind of reject that. Like I didn't like that kind of writing. Like I kind of like writing where, where someone is willing to go out on a limb and risk embarrassing themselves. Mm-hmm. So, Cause they're so out there. And in a way, they're being earnest about how they feel about something, mm-hmm. um, even if it's really easy to make fun of someone like that. Right. Because you know? um, I think it, if you can do that right, I think that's the, kind of the truest and honest type of criticism that you can read. Like that, at least that's what I respond to. No, no, me so, too. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and and the, and like you kind of touched on this a little bit before, but you know, the more personal you do make something, the more universal it actually turns out to be. Um, right. You know, I haven't lived your life. I don't know uh, what it's like to be you, but when I read your writing, I, I understand what you mean because the things you talk about, I can relate to the small things in your life that, you know what I mean? Like, uh, right. like, like I, I'm not you, but I get it. You know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. I mean, and, you know, and that's, you know, if you talk about the songs that people respond to, the films that people respond to, it's, it's exactly what you're talking about. Like where someone has delved into the minutia of their life and, you know, it might seem so specific to one person, but it, it's that weird thing, like, where the more specific you get, the more universal it is. Because, mm-hmm. you know, the thing is, is that, like, when people hear a song, you know, 
they're really only kind of pulling out maybe a lyric or two mm-hmm. that has that kind of hit the chord. You know, like uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of a good example of this. I mean, it, I mean, there's so many examples, but like, I mean, I feel like this is true for for Dylan songs a lot. You know, because like Dylan songs aren't necessarily like a straight narrative. It's usually about like a collection of images or or, or phrases that are really indelible and kind of stick in your mind. Mm-hmm. And you really only need about one or two of those that people really respond to, and then they're going to they'll take those lyrics and they'll make the rest of the song about that. Mm-hmm. And, like, they'll somehow shapeshift the song. So, you know, any reference that you make in there, even if it's, you know, doesn't really apply to you, you like you'll make it apply to you because of that one line that really kind of spoke to you. Well, I mean, uh, let's let's get right down to it. Probably the best example of that it has to be born in the USA, right? Uh, why do you say that? Well, people took the chorus and they thought it thought it was super patriotic, and then they didn't listen to any of the verses. And the verses are all like anti-war, and it's like this guy coming back from Vietnam and he's hard hard up and all this stuff. <laughs> Uh, so you're like, okay, so like you, you're kind of looking at it from like sort of like the exploitation way. Yeah. Right, well, I mean, right? it, I mean, when when the president praises it and doesn't even really seem to know what it's about, it's well, like, like I, we're into new territory. I, I, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think you could also like when I was talking, I was thinking more of like a song like the one I love by REM. You know, like how you know, on one hand, that song I think is clearly about. Uh, an abusive relationship or some mm-hmm. sort of man- uh, manipulation thing. But there's lots of people who hear that song, and uh, this one goes out to the one I love, you know, and they lock in on that line, and they don't really pay attention to the simple prop oh. that, you know, to occupy my time. You know, for them, it's a love song. Every every there's breath you people. take, I guess. Yeah, be exactly. Better. And, um, you know, are they misinterpreting it? Maybe. Or is that just a reflection of how malleable music is as an art form, you know, that um, you can apply to so many different things? Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you mentioned Springsteen. Like, I wrote about this in my book Uh about how, you know, like, I'm fascinated by Chris Christie (laughs) and his relationship with Bruce Springsteen as a fan. You know, because in some ways he's sort of like one of the most sort of famous Bruce Springsteen fans right now. Right. Seen Bruce Springsteen, I think, 130 times. Like he's like he's not like this average politician who like talks about liking a band, uh-huh. but they don't really like the band. I mean, they're sort of pretending to like something to yeah. appear human or you know to other people. But he, Chris Christie, no matter what you think about him as a politician, like he's <laughs> a legitimate Bruce Springsteen fan. And uh, I was fascinated by like him being a fan of this guy. And knowing that Bruce Springsteen doesn't like him back, you know, and that and Bruce Springsteen has made fun of Chris Christie on television, like during the Bridgegate scandal, he went on Jimmy Fallon's show and he sang a song with Jimmy Fallon uh-huh. making fun of Chris Christie, and you know, you know, I can laugh at Chris Christie as being like a lapdog for Donald Trump and. You know, his politics, I don't agree with at all, but like, on the human level of being a Springsteen fan, being mocked by Bruce Springsteen, like, can you imagine what that would be like to be made fun of by Bruce Springsteen? Like, I can't imagine how awful that would be. You know, like, just, cause, like, Bruce Springsteen, you know, one of my biggest heroes, like, he's just the guy I revere. Uh-huh. And if I knew that, if I knew that he, like thought I was a joke, or he, or he hated me, or something. Well, I mean, it's not only uh, that; it's, it, it gets that. worse because it's a, it's like a roast. At a certain right. Point. It's like... But you know, people look at Chris Christie and they say, "Well, how can you be a Bruce Springsteen fan and be a Republican?" So, like, mm-hmm. he's clearly misinterpreting Bruce Springsteen songs. Yeah. But you know, I don't think. Chris Christie misinterprets Bruce Springsteen any more than maybe a lot of people do. I mean, if you, you know, Bruce Springsteen is playing stadiums. That all, you know, yeah. are all those people like liberal Democrats? You know, <laughs> are all those people like you know, like pot, do they all? Yeah. You know, do they understand Woody Guthrie and do they understand <laughs> all that stuff? Of course not. I mean, you could, you know, if you took a poll, I uh-huh. would, I wouldn't be surprised if a, if a majority of the people that paid it to Bruce Springsteen. Are Republicans? 
Well, I, yeah. Well, I think I think a similar thing happened uh, with Rage Against the Machine and Paul Ryan because Paul Ryan does P90X workouts and he needs the, that intense music, so he loves Rage Against the Machine. Now he apparently does is able to completely block out all the lyrics of Rage Against the Machine when he's doing it. It's not like he he doesn't play this at rallies. He just personally likes to listen to Rage Against the Machine when he works out. So this comes out and then Rage Against the Machine, uh, Tom Morello, like basically back him in Rolling Stone, and it's like that's not as bad as the Chris Christie thing because that was that was pretty savage. But um, there was yeah. there was a similar connection with with Paul Ryan with uh, with, with with Rage Against the Machines. So. I mean, I'm, I mean, you know, it, it is kind of a fascinating thing. Yeah, you know, to be like a conservative Republican and also be like a rock and roll fan. Mm-hmm. Like because I just think about about myself. If I know that an artist I love is like super conservative, like it is kind of hard for me to separate that. Mm-hmm. But that just makes me think that I'm spoiled <laughs> because there's obviously lots of people out there who routinely yeah. separate the art from the artist in terms of their political views. Right. You know, who, you know, yeah, Paul Ryan, uh, you know, you could say that he's clueless or you could say that. He actually has an elevated view of art that he can just appreciate the music of something and not have to agree across the board with artists. I mean, that is an interesting thing that we're dealing with now where, um, I don't know, I, I don't know if it's always, I mean, it, it seems worse now that like people are more and more hypersensitive to what artists are like in real life mm-hmm. and, and letting that influence how they view the art. Like, I feel like five years ago, even, it was sort of an accepted thing that, like, artists do bad things in their personal life, but you shouldn't let that influence how you feel about the art. Mm-hmm. You know, the art is separate, it stands alone. Yeah. Um, but increasingly, um, that people don't feel that way. Yeah. And, and I don't know how I feel. You know, my feeling on that is that, um, <laughs> you know, each of us does this sort of equation in our head of like, how much do I like this person's work and how much am I willing to put up with mm-hmm. before I don't like it anymore? Mm-hmm. And it's like some sort of like intangible equation that we all work out. Because, I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, like, like you can look at like Woody Allen, for instance. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people can't, can't watch Woody Allen films anymore. Uh, because of, you know, he's been accused of lusting uh, his, uh, I guess, his, 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 his child, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. And I totally understand that. Um, I still watch Woody Allen films personally, mm-hmm. but like I understand why someone else wouldn't. Um, but there's other artists that I can't enjoy because for that reason. But I also know that like if I if I delved too deeply into like the Rolling Stones and what they did in the 60s or Led Zeppelin, mm-hmm. I couldn't, I I wouldn't be able to like anything. Uh, so like for some artists, I'm just consciously keeping myself ignorant. I don't know. It's a, it's a hard thing. I don't know how we got, I don't know how I got in this tangent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but I don't know. Oh, I feel exactly the same way about, about the art and the artist because first of all, your world gets pretty small pretty quickly if you start taking into account everything everyone's done um, yeah. get, get ready to not enjoy the Beatles ever again if, if you don't enjoy domestic violence uh, so you know what it means but, <laughs> but at the same time it's like you know and I understand like you know there's a lot of people who are saying like well the, you know we the entertainment business there are decades of sort of mm-hmm. just sweeping stuff under the rug where abusive men can do whatever they want mm-hmm. and there's no repercussions um and, I and, yeah. and, you know, Bill Cosby was the game changer there because Bill Cosby for years, you know, sort of rumored that mm-hmm. women were accusing him of things, but, like, people never took it seriously. Yeah. And finally they did, and all of a sudden, you know, Bill Cosby is like a monster, you yeah. know? Like, and no one likes Bill Cosby anymore. But right. once you have Cosby then, you know... Why are you going to let other people off the hook? Mm-hmm. You know, why him? I mean, now there's this Casey Affleck thing going on. I don't, mm-hmm. know, I don't know if you've been following that. I have. Because, like, the Nate Parker thing with uh, yeah. Birth of Nation, and now uh, this Casey Affleck. And it's like, I saw Manchester by the Sea. I thought Casey Affleck was amazing in that movie. Mm-hmm. But, uh, 
you know, I don't know. Do I need to read court documents to measure his guilt? No. Yeah, what's the responsibility of the audience here? It's so murky with some of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Whether someone is guilty or not, or what exactly it is that they did, mm-hmm. and like, what are you know, and what the, you know, is it a zero tolerance policy, mm-hmm. or are there degrees of crimes where okay, you know, if you cross this line, then your art is terrible, and I can't enjoy it anymore. Yeah. If you stay on this other side, your art is acceptable. I can keep enjoying it. You know. <laughs> It's a really difficult thing. I, I don't know. It's uh, I just yeah. Feel, I well, I mean, it does. You know, I love that Gary Glitter song, "Rock and Roll Part Two and Part One, frankly, too. <laughs> um, but yeah. I cannot listen to that song and not. There's a big red flashing light in my head that says "child molester, child molester" the whole time that song's playing, and I. I love that song. I love that song. I love listening to that song. But that is like it's hard to get over. It's hard to get past with some people. Um, I'm I'm with you, man. I, I'm all the way. I've I've written about this before. It's it's you have to separate the art from the artist. You just have to. Um, but like the thing is, is that like I don't feel that way 100. percent I don't know how it's possible to feel one way. Because there's mm-hmm. some people who say. We have to allow for it to be a possibility. I think some people are very zero tolerance. I mean, I, what I what I think is true, and people maybe don't want to say this, is that there are some artists who people love so much that they're willing to put up with more in order, you know, before they would, you know, forsake them. Well, there's other people. It's like Chris Brown. It's like well, Chris Brown. He's obviously a piece of garbage. I don't care. His music is nowhere near good enough to justify uh, what he did to, you know, what he's done to Rihanna and all that. Although for a lot of people, it is. Like, he's he's actually done pretty well, even though he had a horrible scandal. Um, but, like, Michael Jackson. Like, I love Michael Jackson. Uh, he's one of the greatest singers ever, as far as I'm concerned. I love his music. Mm-hmm. And he's probably a monster. Like, how can I justify that? Uh, I would, I, I would argue he's a monster and a victim. I would, I would also I say I would argue that. But like, does that mitigate what he did? You know? No, <laughs> but know. I'm, 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 I'm not thinking he had the healthiest upbringing. Um, well, well, but like, you know, who does? <laughs> you are. You know, very few people who like are like, oh yeah, he was. It was great. Great life led him to this path of molestation. Um, I mean, it's tough though. It's like yeah, it is, it is tough. I'm not going to say it's not it's tough, like, but like yeah, he's a monster. But like, holy shit! Like, uh, it's not to get enough. It's like that's an amazing song. You know? Yeah. It, it's such a. Um, it's such a cheap thing, I mean, to say it out loud, but I feel like it's obviously what people do. I mean, you know, like, or Roman Polanski. Mm-hmm. Roman Polanski, like, I watched, I rewatched uh, Rosemary's Baby recently. Yeah. That's, like, one of the greatest movies ever made. Like, that movie is incredible. But, like, Roman Polanski, you know, probably raped a 14-year-old girl in a hot tub. You know, like, how awful is that? Mm-hmm. But he also made Chinatown. I mm-hmm. love Chinatown. <laughs> it's like I don't know. Hey, even uh, even Charles Manson wrote a Beatles or not a Beatles song, Beach Boys song. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, you know, Manson <laughs> rewrote it though pretty pretty extensively. But, sure. <laughs> I'm know. just saying it. Not that that's any comparison, but I'm just saying like it. You have to go. I mean, go back through history. George Washington owned slaves. Uh, you know. So yeah. It it, it, it yeah. gets deep. You know. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's uh, it's crazy, but this is going to continue to be uh, an issue. I mean, it's probably going to get worse. Yeah, and, and I, don't, I don't mean to use the word worse. It's going to become kind of more. I mean, things do not go away now. Yeah, you know, and Bill. Co- you know, that's another Bill Cosby thing. You know, like there's no. You know, there used to be this thing like where, and you can see this with Casey Affleck now, where. Mm-hmm. You know, he's not really talking about it, and I think there's this idea that, well, if we don't talk about it, it'll eventually go away. Mm -hmm. And so far it's working, but it never really kind of goes away. There's always this kind of low hum in the background, and um, you never know when it's going to bubble up again. Um, 
Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's it's such a weird thing. I mean, you know, we... And there's always time to find out about new horrible things, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, even if you don't know something before, it can still be unacceptable, but you may not just know it yet. Like, what was that movie with Marlon Brando where he, like, raped a woman on screen or whatever? Well, The Last Tango in Paris. And, and, yeah. And, and, and that's another thing, like, where... It like you know. Can you? Well, I've never seen it, but can you watch it? I don't know if I ever should. Now. Well, there's a thing that like where the like because like Maria Schneider said that she felt like she was raped because there's a scene like where he uh, basically uh, they're having anal sex with like a stick of butter, it's like a mm-hmm. famous scene in the movie, and like she didn't know that that was going to happen apparently, mm-hmm. and so she, and she said later the actress in the scene said that she felt like she was raped. But then, I mean, I've read various things about this, about sort of consent, and it's unclear if she technically was raped. Mm -hmm. Because to say that you feel like you were raped does not mean that you were raped. I mean, I feel uncomfortable discussing this because I feel like I don't know enough. But well, I, that's the thing. I We're always enough, getting more uh, more educated on this uh, every day. I know that so. it's not black and white, mm-hmm. that situation. Um, but I don't know. I mean... Well, my, my, only, my only point was that things can come out all the time. You know, like, you, I didn't yeah. know that before, and then suddenly that was in the news, and I was like, oh, boy, I didn't know that. <laughs> well, the other thing about this, too, that's kind of weird is that, like, you know, there's incentive in the attention economy to perpetuate these things sometimes, mm-hmm. like where, I mean, the thing that's kind of weird is that, like, things don't go away, which is which can be a good thing because things should be swept under the rug sometimes, but there's also this situation, like, where you can't really ever do your penance for something. Like, if you did something bad, mm-hmm. it's kind of always there, and it's easy to bring it back up again. So you're kind of... You know, we may have the situation now in the culture, like where people are just sort of perpetually punished for something they did in their past. Well, have Holy you ever read uh, John Ronson's book? Uh, so you've been publicly shamed. Yeah, yeah, I read that. Yeah, I think he talks about this in the book a little bit. But there's a movement. Uh, I think it's in Europe right now, mostly. But it's a right to be forgotten. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, and basically you get. Google to take off the search page, uh, off the first page of Google. It's still there. The link is still alive, but it just doesn't show up when people search for it. So, um, you know, I, you know, on a much more benign tip, uh, you know, I, I went back and read some things I wrote in high school from a high school newspaper, and I'm just, I, I'm just happy that I don't have to show anybody that I can tell people that I wrote from my high school newspaper. I don't need to tell anybody what I wrote or let them see it. <laughs> and I'm glad that option exists for me because, you know, I was learning how to write. And you know, I don't really necessarily need anyone else to see that ever again. But I'm glad I was able able to do that in an environment where um, that was allowed. I feel like now everything everyone does when they come up in the world is recorded forever, like you were saying. So it's it's, yeah, it's going to be I, harder and harder to look through the pale lens of history or whatever. So, well, yeah, like you know, as far as like writing goes, but you know, I'm 39. I started working in journalism in the year 2000, mm-hmm. and I feel like I was sort of on the like outer edge of like everything being documented on the internet. Like I worked for a daily newspaper that didn't have a great on- online archive, so like most of the writing I did before the age of like 29, like you can't find mm. because. It just wasn't that well archived. I've also ri- I've also written for publications that don't exist anymore. Mm. So like those archives aren't even online anymore. So it's like, like I worked for uh, um, when I was at the AV Club. I was the editor of the of AV Club Milwaukee because AV Club had weekly editions and uh, actually it was daily. They were weekly editions that turned into daily websites mm-hmm. in like 10 cities. Mm-hmm. And I was the editor of the one in Milwaukee. And then after four years, they shut it down mm-hmm. and they killed the archive. Mm-hmm. So like all of the, so like I wrote hundreds of stories for that, mm-hmm. all gone. Um, so, you know, that's devastating. Way, that's like, bad. that's like a that's horror. That's like a horror movie hearing that. That's to that's me. <laughs> It's like some stuff I'm glad doesn't <laughs> stuff like I wish was there. Yeah. Uh, but uh yeah, I mean now 
I mean, I was just thinking about this with, with my kids. I have, I have two kids, mm-hmm. and I, I probably have more photos of them already. Yeah. Like, I have a four-year-old son, and I have a, a three-month-old daughter. I probably have more photos of them already than like my parents had of me throughout <laughs> my entire childhood. Yeah. You know, like they're they're going to be so documented. Yeah. There's, there's so many videos of them, like. I, you know, I'm trying to think of like how many photos <laughs> of me there are from like about four. Oh yeah, and I probably have like like two or three at the most. <laughs> and so yeah. like the way I think of myself from that age mm-hmm. is informed by like two or three photos. Right. Whereas like my kids are going to have like a million photos. You know, it's going to be like everyone's going to have like a documentary of their own life that they can look back on. Mm-hmm. And I wonder how that's going to affect memories. You know, because like for someone like me, you know, in a way I can I can mythologize my own past mm-hmm. because there's no real record of what it was like. Like, you know, I have my own memories, but that's kind of informed by like how I view my own past or, you know, I have sort of a self-deprecating sense of humor. So, like, you know, in a way, my childhood is probably funnier than it actually was, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's a more distorted view of it. Um, But it's a way that it's kind of like... Uh, but I kind of like that. I like the myth- I, like, I like having the ability to mythologize your own past. But like now, if there's so much documentation, mm-hmm. are you just are you are you going to know too much about your own past? I don't know. Maybe maybe in a way, it's, like in a way, I'm I'm glad, for instance, that I don't have that many photos of myself when I was 14 or something. <laughs> like when I was so <laughs> repulsive, you know, because that right. was almost too depressing. Oh yeah. But, well, I, I have my, uh, I have my somewhere deep, deep, deep buried in the archives. I have my uh, sixth grade uh, wrestling photo, and uh, and no one ever needs to see me in singlet at at that age. Um, so, but but that was like one of six photos I probably had taken that year. Like like you were saying, yeah. it's it's really uh, kind of hazy back then what was really going on. And you know, my, yeah. My, yeah, my my wife uh, really uh, reads a lot of mommy blogs, for example. Um, and people are, you know, wholesaling their children's uh, just from the before they're born through what, you know, the people are on, the kids are online immediately. Um, and that wasn't an option when you and I were growing up. But now yeah. it's like people are going to be documented without their consent, really. I mean, how can a newborn consent to anything, you know? So. Right. They're documented without their consent, and it's also broadcast. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, and I do this too. I share photos of my kids. Right. Um, Although I'm slightly paranoid about it because, you know, uh, you don't know. I mean, you're putting it on this website that you don't own. You don't know what's going to happen to that. Sure. Like, if you want to get, like, paranoid about it, it's like, it's not even that paranoid, really. It's, mm-hmm. it's kind of a weird thing to do um, to put so much personal information on these sites, you know, that mm-hmm. are. Being, you know, making other people money, you know, and that you really don't have any control over. It's sure. Crazy, but definitely. Well, I don't know how we got talking about all this, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but I really did want to talk about a couple of things uh, in the book and also in in the series we were discussing. Um, Oasis versus uh, Blur was is your first chapter, and that really grabbed me right away because um, I love both bands. Um, now I will say, on my college dorm wall, I had a Blur poster, so mm. I I'm throwing down that gauntlet. But I, I, but but you know, as as I've gotten older, I have rediscovered because I I had uh, what's the story uh, in in high school, loved it. Um, later, I got to appreciate uh, Be Here Now, which I know you love too. Um, oh yeah. Oh my God, I I think that's such an underrated album. And you know, if the only twe- tweak I would make is I would I would I would not kill the bass because uh, they completely troubled that whole thing out and made it so loud. But that's fine; it's part of its charm. But I would like. 
like to hear a little bit more of the bass. But other than that, it's it's a great album. Don't mind the 26 minute songs or whatever. It's, it's yeah. I love it. Um, but late, later in my life, I've I've grown to appreciate uh, o- Oasis more. Um, not maybe more than Blur, because Blur will always have that special place for me. But um, which is yeah, interesting. I I, I want to tie this to one more thing. Uh, in later in the book, you, you do of course the Rolling Stones versus the Beatles, and I completely agree with you on that account. I'm totally a Stones guy, and I've had this uh, discussion with uh, one of my previous guests, Melanie, and she asked me that question, Rolling Stones versus Beatles, and uh, I've, I've always just had to identify more with Rolling Stones, So, but I, I kind of view the Oasis uh, Blur divide uh, differently. I feel like Blur is maybe the Rolling Stones. Oh, no way. Really? Why would why is Blur the Rolling Stones? Well, they're they're art school kids. They're kind of more uh, middle class than Oasis, who is from you know Hard Scrabble, Manchester. Um, so you know, they're, like they're they're the actual like like the Beatles are 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 Oasis. Well, I, well, I mean, actually, I mean Oasis uh, Oasis is the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, and like Blur is like the Kinks. Okay, fair enough. Okay. So I, and I love the Kinks. I'm not disparaging the Kinks, but like I mean. But the Oasis is the Stones because they're they're rock and roll. But they're but they uh, they have a very Beatles. You can't deny the Beatles connection in Oasis. Come on now. Oh, of course not. Of course they're, they're the Beatles and the Stones. But like and I don't know. Oh yeah. Really? Oh yeah. Because I mean, Oasis is like way bigger than Blur anyway. I mean like <laughs> they're way more important than Blur. I mean I I don't even think that's a really even a debate. But <laughs> you, you, you could argue that Blur is like. I read this in the book. They're, I think they're more consistent. Uh-huh. They're more adventurous. They probably yeah. have like a better kind of more rounded discography. But like, who gives a shit? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Like Oasis songs are like way, but you know, like come on. Like there's no Blur song that's comparable to like Live Forever, Wonderwall, Don't Look Back in Anger. These sort of like stadium sized anthems. Mean like the Beatles. Even like, but like, yeah. but like, come on, like that's early seventies. You know, Exxon Main Street, Sticky mm-hmm. Fingers, doing lots of drugs. Okay, fair enough. Know, I'll give you the decadent. drugs. <laughs> like, like, I mean, like, come on, like, there's uh, Blur is is has a fey British thing to them that like <laughs> is not. It, it, it's just not. It does not do with the Stones' aesthetic. Like, there's nothing earthy about Blur. There's nothing like, uh, you know, they're not like. They're way more musically adventurous. There's, there's no swagger to, to Blur. You know, they don't have that swagger. <laughs> they have that rock and rollness. You know, like uh... that Oasis does. Oasis. I mean, come on. Like Oasis clearly is the more rock and roll. Band. And I mean, you can love Blur, but like they're not as rock and roll as Oasis is. And like Rolling Stones epitomize <laughs> that sort of decadent rock and roll thing. Uh-huh. Um, so yeah, I, I would say Oasis is the Beatles and the Stones. Okay. And Blur is like the Kinks, or maybe like um, maybe the Kinks are even too big for Blur. Maybe they're more like I don't know. They're sort of like upscale Herman's Hermits or something. That's the most withering thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Um, you know. <laughs> but. Wow. Uh, this was great. My friend went to see Blur <laughs> at Madison Square Garden. Uh-huh. We, like, like a year or two ago. And he was sending me photos of like empty sections of seats at Madison Square Garden. Just be like, yeah, I'm going to show. Because he's also an Oasis guy. And he was, I, I just thought it was hilarious that like he was sending me photos of empty seats. So he thought, he thought I would enjoy seeing that. Uh, you know, and like really, I don't really, it's weird because like I really don't have any animus towards Blur anymore, but like people ask about it all the time, and like it kind of riles me up. I, I can tell. <laughs> and then I start like like it, like you know it's not like I sit in my house and I just get pissed at Damon Albert. <laughs> but like people ask me about it all the time, and I'm like, well, um, 
Yeah, I, I just get riled up, and then I end up. Okay, I, I get that you didn't like. I, I, I get that you didn't like the good, the bad, and the queen. That's understandable. That's fine. I'm not asking. You know, I'm not asking that of you. I'm just saying, the gorilla, gorillas was good, right? And Del, Delta one thirty thirty. I have no, I have no opinion because I didn't listen to it. I, I don't wow. Care about it. Okay. I, mean, I know that's not Clint Eastwood, but like I'm, I don't care. Huh. I mean, Damon Albert, I, 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 I'm indifferent. I, I, I really don't care. If you want to ask me about BDI though, or No Gallagher Flying Birds, I have lots of opinions mm-hmm. about those. I, I, I was listening to BDI. BDI, are you familiar with BDI? That's like the. Uh, it's the reformed oh, yeah. Oasis minus uh, Noel, yeah. Well, it's William Gallagher and um, I guess Jim Archer is in the band, and then. Um, is Andy Bell in BDI? I think he is. Mm. Um, but like, uh, I was listening to BDI the other day, mm. and I was like, "This track's pretty good. Mm. I'm enjoying BDI." I was like, "Man, this is this is definitely advanced Oasis <laughs> fandom." If, if I'm listening to BDI right. in 2018 and enjoying it, but um, yeah, I don't know. It was, it's funny. Like we were talking about alternative nation before, like. Mm. When I was writing that, like a lot of those bands were unfashionable. Like I feel like when I was writing this book, just a couple of years ago, that like it was really kind of fashionable to, to love Blur mm. and to sort of like shit on Oasis. <laughs> but like, but like even in the last couple of years, that's changed. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's because of that documentary that came out recently. Yeah, I really want to see that. I can't. I haven't or, seen it yet. Or, but... uh, uh, you know, I don't know what it is, but like it's kind of cool to like Oasis again, mm-hmm. and um, like I, I, I don't know. Maybe I just have a distorted view of this because people want to talk to me about Oasis a lot, so maybe I just hear about it more than the average person. But um, I feel like there's more Oasis support now than there was maybe even a couple of years ago, and that makes me very happy because mm-hmm. it did seem like, you know. It was just cooler to, yeah, you know, like it was hipper to like blur, or that it was smarter to like blur, and it sort of like kind of scoff at Oasis. But I mean, like in America anyway, I mean, blur does does not matter at all. I mean, there's lots of people. That, <laughs> they don't. I mean, they don't. They, they, they saw it too. That's it. They they were not a big band in America. Like Oasis was legitimately big in America. Yes, I I had oh, I I didn't seek out Oasis. Oasis came to me. I had to seek out Blur. Like, I mean, like like if you were a Britpop fan in the '90s, like a lot of people liked Blur mm-hmm. more than Oasis because Oasis was on MTV all the time. It was they were sort of like um, the Coca Cola of Britpop bands. Mm-hmm. You know, like they're everywhere. Um, so it was cooler to like Blur or like Supergrass or the London Suede or you know. How how dare you denigrate or, or Blur by, by by comparing them to those bands? What? <laughs> I Supergrass and I like I, I like Supergrass and Suede and Pulp and. Uh, yeah, but you called Blur a second-rate Herman's Hermits or whatever. <laughs> Well, I would, I, because I would actually say that Supergrass is the king. I don't even want to give the kinks the blur. I want to give the kinks the Supergrass. Wow. Supergrass is awesome. And, like, the verb would be, like, kind of the Pink Floyd. They're kind of Floydy. And then, um, you know, Pulp. I mean, Pulp kind of has some kinksy aspects to them, too, actually. Mm-hmm. They kind of felt social commentary, like, arch Britishness. Um, but, I mean, I'm not as big of a pulp fan as some people. Mm. Um, but uh, Suede, I like, I've actually been listening to London Suede lately. They're, they're a good band. They got, they had no traction in America at all, but, like, mm. they're a pretty awesome band. Like, uh, if you're into that sort of David Bowie Smith type mm-hmm. thing, you know, they're a good band. I like Lennon Sweet more than Blur, so sorry, Blur. Sweet. <laughs> no, I, I get, I, I just get a kick out of how much you hate Blur. It, it, it makes me laugh. I well, enjoy it. It's not even hate. It's just indifference. Like I don't, <laughs> I just, I never. Like, I write a book, and that people ask me, "Are you serious?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I did not listen to Blur. Like I, I hear things here and there, but I was like, no, I'm not even going to bother with it. I don't need it." <laughs> But that's okay. I, what I, I heard, that, what I, heard that I didn't really like. That's fine. But, but it was like, no, I. to me, 
to have Oasis and Blur, you have Oasis and Blur when you're 16. Mm. To pick Blur, I don't understand it. I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> I, I mean, Oasis' this whole thing is blur. like okay, okay, but but they're not going for the same thing. So it's just it's it's more like what do you want out of a band? Do you want a band that's that's going for just undeniability? Because oh, guess what? Oasis is your band. You know they they are undeniable. Um, they will not be denied. Blur, you know, you can be denied. Go ahead, whatever. <laughs> We're gonna be over here doing this thing. Oh, how how inspiring for a band? Yeah. We, we'll be denied. Yeah, that's fine. You know, <laughs> how, was that, how was that inspiring? I just, no, I just mean, like, it's not so anthematic, I guess, is, is the... It's like, you know, they didn't rock as hard or in school. <laughs> well, they don't. Or does not rock as hard as Oasis. Uh, like, it, if you like Blur, it's not because they rock, because they don't. Okay, you like them because you think they're clever, or like they had kind of like catchy songs, but rockingness is not in the top ten blur quality. No, it's it's just not. Like Oasis is cooler. You know, they're they're more fun to drink to. Uh, they have better B sides. I mean, come on. Okay, I'll give you I'll give you the B side thing. That was. I go down the list. Well, I. I, I don't know. Is that a controversial opinion to say Blur doesn't rock? I mean, I just don't think of them as like a rock band. You know, like, you know, like Boys and Girls. That's not really a rocking song. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a clever song. And like, ooh, David Alburn, he's really tweaking social norms. You know, with their, you know or whatever it is. You know, but I, you're not going to be like, oh, this one rocks. <laughs> You know, like 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 rock and roll star does, or something, or, or some might say, or acquiesce. Mm -hmm. You know, to get into the B sides yeah. uh, of Oasis. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I think history itself. I think history has answered this question anyway. So <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Okay. All right. <laughs> Um, now you wrote this book um, before Prince died, and yeah. uh, there was a lot of sections where I read where you wrote wrote about Prince. Uh, you, you of course were writing him as about him as a, an alive person. Um, I wonder what would be different if you had written this after Prince had died. Well, I would say that he died. Well, that was step, that, one. That, that, step one. Step one. Big thing. I'd be writing about him as a dead person, not as a living person. I mean, you know. People have asked me about this, and, you know, I mean, my book came out on May 17th, mm -hmm. and Prince died, I think, on April 21st, so it was about three weeks or so, mm -hmm. so it was very tight. I mean, I, I, some people were like, well, why didn't you pull the book and rewrite the chapter? It's like, well, yeah, it's not really how publishing works. Like, I, I turned the book, like, 14 months before it was published. I mean, that's how long of a lead time sometimes there is in publishing it's, it's insane mm -hmm. um, but I don't know I mean I, you know, I think you know when someone dies it obviously affects how you feel about them because you're no longer looking at them as a living person you're looking at them as sort of the totality of their legacy that becomes who they're about and you know one of the things in that chapter I talk about is how Michael Jackson you know how people talked about him changed a lot after he died, mm -hmm. because it, when he was alive, there was always this dark cloud over him, you know, and it was, it was the, the sexual abuse allegations, mm -hmm. and and also just his sort of general weirdness, you know, it made it hard to appreciate his his music. Mm -hmm. And when he died, the sad thing is, is that it did sort of liberate a lot of people. Uh, in terms of their appreciation of him, it, it became a lot easier to just sort of separate him from his sins. Well, well kind of going yeah. back to our previous discussion of, like, but, for example, Woody Allen, if you want to go with that, like, my wife refuses to uh, give any money to Woody Allen, so she won't go see it in a theater, she won't pay right. for it at a, at a red box or wherever you rent movies, she won't buy it, um, she will see it if it's free, if it's on Netflix or something, uh, or if it some, comes to us some, somehow else where we didn't have to pay any money, but she doesn't want to contribute to the lifestyle, which she, she sees as wrong, and 
and uh, you know, I think that's that's kind of a good way to go about it in certain ways. But but the person's still alive in that respect. But you know, like you're saying, if the person's no longer with us, it's not really like you're enriching their lifestyle. It's just like you get to like kind of step back from it a little bit and be like, okay, what do we have here? You know, the, I don't have to like attach this because this person couldn't be enjoying anything from me enjoying this. You know. Yeah, I mean, I mean what I was just gonna say, like in relation to Prince, is that like when when Prince died, you know, I mean, Prince didn't have the same sort of thing that Michael Jackson did. I mean, there wasn't a cloud around him, but like Prince basically for 20 years was kind of making music in the wilderness. I mean, he really, it had been a long time since he made a song, much less an album that resonated with anyone beyond sort of the Prince cult. And yet when he died, he did become a contemporary artist again, you know, because, you know, people were, were reminded of this great body of work that he had. And, and people talked about him differently. You know, there was a new level of appreciation for him. You know, and when I wrote the chapter, Prince was still alive. So, like, I think... In a way, I wrote about him in a more clear-eyed way mm-hmm. than I would have if I had written that after he died. Mm-hmm. Like, in a way, that chapter, I mean, the shittiness of the timing of that is that, like, there's probably parts of that chapter where I'm being overly harsh to Prince, or it seems like I'm being overly harsh to him. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, there's things in there where, you know, the thing about that chapter, it's about the dynamic between Michael Jackson and Prince, and about how in the 80s there was this thing between Michael, where, where, where Prince was sort of the upstart, mm-hmm. and Michael Jackson was the established brand. And people looked at Prince as being this sort of weirdo, and Michael Jackson as being sort of like the family-friendly star. And 20 years later, like in the 2000s, it, it flipped, mm-hmm. and Prince became more of like a sort of a, a idealized icon, and Michael Jackson became this sort of ostracized freak. And I thought that was an interesting sort of flip mm-hmm. of that narrative. And in the chapter, you know, I love Michael Jackson and Prince both. Like, I'm huge fans of both. But, like, I, I was a, I was maybe more sympathetic to Michael Jackson um, because I do feel like he was so hugely popular in his prime mm-hmm. that, like, to be that popular uh, is a really hard thing to be. In a way, I feel like Prince had it easier because it's easier to be the insurgent going against this sort of big brand mm-hmm. sometimes than it is to be hugely popular. I mean, just because people turned on Michael Jackson yeah. in a way. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, there's a line towards the end of that chapter where I, where I talk about, you know, like, who won this rivalry? It's like, well, I guess Prince did because he lived. Of mm-hmm. course, he died right after that. Um, so now it's a little bit murkier, maybe, because... Now they're both these sort of untouchable legends. I mean, you know, I mean, there's so many things that are sad about Prince dying mm-hmm. at 57. I mean, he did seem like a guy. I don't know if he would have made another great record because it, it seemed like his days, at least as like a great pop artist, were well behind him. Um, of course, you never know. I mean, there was always the possibility that he could have done that, which, you know, it sucks that we lost that possibility. But it seems like that at least he would have performed great concerts for like another 20 years, mm-hmm. you know, and that would have been great to see. So, you know, um, that's a shame. It's one of the many sad things about him dying so so young. Right. Well, and I think I think the difference also between him and Michael Jackson in death now is that we can see um, Prince more as just merely self-destructive as just opposed to being destructive like we view Michael Jackson being. Like he, um, you know, see, he's viewed think, as more of a villainous person because he did villainous deeds to other people. Um, I don't and see that... It was really I, just a self-crime for Prince. Like he kind of destroyed himself uh, sadly. See, I don't see it that way. I, I don't think that the way Prince died is going to really impact. Oh, no, um, I'm just saying it doesn't have the baggage the of, of Michael that, like, Jackson. I think, I think Michael Jackson's demise, it was so protracted and long mm-hmm. that I think that's going to be a part of his story yeah. in a way that it's, in a way that's like a part of Elvis's story. Mm-hmm. You know, like you can see the decline right. going on. I think with Prince, 
I don't know if people are going to remember his death or the way he died as much because I think at least he looked good, you know, like he still seemed vital. And it, I, th- I think in a way his death seems almost like an accident, hmm. even though he, there, there was drug abuse going on. It's not, but it's not the same, I think, as Michael Jackson, where mm-hmm. it almost does, like in the same way that Elvis' story seems like a parable about celebrity. Right. Michael Jackson, I think, has the same thing. Sure. Well, I mean, but you could argue, though, that Prince also has residual effects from, from trying so hard, because it wasn't it because of his giant leaping kicks that he did on yeah, stage. Yeah, but, but again, I think I, I think that it's because it's not as visible with him, I don't know, I mean, I don't know how this is going to be remembered, but if I had to guess, I don't think that's going to be as big of a part with him, because hmm. I think the physical, like, manifestation is important. Like, with Elvis... It's like the fat Elvis. Like you yeah. can look at him, you can compare a picture of Elvis in '77 to '55, and you can see the difference. And Michael Jackson, you can take a picture of him from 1982 mm-hmm. and 2009, and you can see the difference. Like Prince still looked good. You know, there was obviously stuff going on in his personal life that was dark, but um, I don't know. I think when we, and you can see this already. Like people were talking about his halftime show. You know, like the 10th anniversary of his halftime show. Mm-hmm. Like, I think when people talk about late stage Prince, they're going to remember that. Or like he was on Saturday Night Live a couple of years ago and he did a really good job. Mm-hmm. Like he still looked good and he still sounded good. Mm-hmm. And the others and the stuff that was going on in his personal life, I don't know. I I feel like over time that's going to get whitewashed. Mm-hmm. You know, and it won't be because it's not as obvious. You know, Michael Jackson, it's like so obvious what happened to him mm-hmm. and the sadness of that, you know, like just his beauty being destroyed. Like Prince, um, he still, you know, his beauty wasn't destroyed. Mm-hmm. You know, he was able to maintain it even if he was using drugs at the end, mm-hmm. you know. So that would be my guess. My, 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 <laughs> you know, as far as how he's remembered. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. But you uh, you yourself do a, a really good podcast that I, I've been listening to a lot, which is the Celebration Rock podcast. Is that coming back yeah. soon? Yeah, March 6th, I think, or whatever the Monday is around then, but at early March. Cool. So uh, I already started recording some interviews for that. So, um, yeah, I'm excited to bring that back. Yeah, Fun and that's, that's through uh, working with a radio station, is that correct? Yeah, 93X here in uh, Minneapolis. Very cool, yeah. Yeah. Um, I love when you have Chuck Klosterman on. Uh, always love when you get him on the podcast. He's always got interesting things. He's a podcast hall of famer. He's like one of the best guests of all time. Oh, man, so I'm, I'm, I'm on anyone's show. So, always grateful when he... Returns my email to come on. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, and I, uh, I always enjoyed your writing on Grantland. I have to say that that was uh, a, a great, uh, great site that I'm sad to see that isn't around anymore. But uh, I definitely yeah. enjoyed that. So um, anyway, uh, you're uh, working on another book, right? Uh, or is that coming out next year? Is that correct? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, February of 2018. That's the that's the date that we have set right now. So uh, hopefully that will hold, mm. and it'll be coming out then. But yeah, it, it, my deadline is uh, in a couple months, so I'm in the home stretch of that. Okay. Right now, so yeah. And what is that uh, book? Can you tell us anything about it? Yeah, it's it, uh, yeah, it's a book about the mythology of classic rock, and uh, so uh, and sort of like the rise and fall of classic rock, um, kind of inspired by, like, the recent deaths that have occurred, like, with Bowie and Prince and people like that. Mm-hmm. And sort of looking at, like, why albums have mattered throughout history, like why the live concert matters and, you know, partying in the parking lot and all these sort of rituals associated with classic rock and what where that came from, why it mattered, and what's happening to it. Uh, in the modern age. So, um, I don't know. I'm excited about it. I think it's been a really good book. Um, so, like, if you like, uh, if you like discussions about albums and concerts and 
all that and classic rock bands and all that kind of stuff. It, it uh, will definitely be up your alley. Great. Well, I love this book. I thought it was great. Um, is uh, there anything else I didn't ask you about that you wanted to get out before we go? Uh, I don't think so. Cool. Well, uh, it was a great talk, and uh, thanks so much for doing this. And I'm looking forward to reading whatever you do next. So, um, all right, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate you uh, inviting me on. Yeah, no problem. But uh, take care of yourself, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. All right, man. Take care. Thanks. Bye bye. If you enjoy this podcast, there are several ways to support it. I have a Patreon account, which can be found at www.patreon.com forward slash Rob Burgess Show Patreon. I hope you'll consider supporting in any amount. Also, please make sure to comment, follow, like, subscribe, share, rate, and review the podcast everywhere it's available, which includes iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Facebook, Twitter, Internet Archive, TuneIn, and RSS. It really helps. The official website for the podcast is www.therobburgessshow.com. You can find out more about me by visiting my website, www.thisburgess.com. Until next time.